So, thank you for waiting so patiently for the start of session D1, New Improvers Transforming Healthcare. Um, my name's Helen Bevan. I'm, I work for NHS Improving Quality in England, and I'm part of the Strategic Advisory Board of the International Forum. And I really do think that this is going to be the best session um, in, the, in the whole forum. So um, what we've got here are um, eight people who are all at the top of their game in terms of learning as, as, um, as clinicians, as practitioners, um, as teachers. And um, what they've done today is stepped outside of their comfort zone. And what they're going to do, um, each of our eight colleagues is going to present their strategy for engaging clinicians in quality improvement, but they're going to do it in a special kind of format which is called Pachuchka or Pechakucha, or however else you want to pronounce it. So this is what was in the brochure to entice you to come to this session. So what you're going to get from our eight colleagues here is a range of perspectives and insights and views from people who are at the leading edge of initiatives to engage um, clinical trainees in quality improvement. And what you're going to get, the kind of special treat that you're going to get today, is to experience the um, Pachuchka presentation method. And what we know is this massively increases the impact of presentations and the retention of ideas by an audience. So, you know, you'll go home from the forum and in six months' time, you will remember key things from these presentations that you won't remember from um, other presentations. Hopefully. <laughs> and... The idea is that we want to kind of do things in different ways, create different learning methods in the forum. And the idea is that you will learn as much about strategies to engage trainees in quality improvement in 90 minutes here, or a bit less than 90 minutes now here, as would take four hours um, in conventional presentations. And what you will definitely get from our um, eight speakers is an exhilarating variety of ideas and projects from a range of viewpoints from across the world. What I'd say about this session, it is the best rehearsed session in the history of the International Forum. Um, we've actually been working together, rehearsing, since January. And we've had six separate re rehearsal sessions, either virtually um, or together. Because, um, yeah, Pachuchka's, it's very effective, but it takes an awful lot of work. So, um, so let's look at it. Now, one thing I want to say about this slide, this is the last conventional slide that you will see in this presentation. So please um, do join in, and we'd love to have your comments and your views and your questions. Um, if you can use the hashtag quality2014 and also our session hashtag, which is D1. And we'll see where we are at the end and um, whether we've got time for some, some tweets. So... So why are we doing this? Actually, you know, having the kind of presentations that are clear and short and impactful um, often doesn't happen, okay? So, you know, we want to do things differently. Maybe putting it another way. You know, um, here's the devil, and, um, and he's saying, I need someone well-versed in the art of torture. Do you know PowerPoint? So this is a kind of an alternative to a classic PowerPoint presentation, okay? So Petruchka is a way of presenting that was developed in Japan um, over a decade ago. And what happens is each of our presenters has prepared 20 slides. Their presentations are, on, um, are automatically timed, so they will automatically, the slide will switch to the next slide after 20 seconds, so it's completely auto-run. So after 6 minutes and 40 seconds, each of our presenters will then sit down. Okay, so we're going to hear eight presentations all in that format. And, you know, why we've been practicing for so long is because this is a very difficult thing to do. You know, um, 20 images each for 20 seconds. And every one of our presenters has got a very big story and an important story to tell. And what they've had to do is to kind of hone it down into six minutes and 40 seconds. You know, one of the great things I'd say about this is that um, with Pachuchka, where you have a bad speaker, it doesn't matter so much because it only goes on for six minutes and 40 seconds. Okay? Not that we've got any bad speakers because I can guarantee they're all outstanding. Um, I've heard them many times. So the whole thing about Pachuchka, it's a kind of an, a movement. Um, it's a way of doing things. Um, 
Pachuchka nights are held in cities across the world. There's over 400 cities that run a Pachuchka night. And basically, people get up uh, and make presentations on kind of any topic at all. And it's a really fun thing to do. I go to Pachuchka night in my city, which is in Coventry in England. Has anybody in the audience been to a Pachuchka night? Okay. Can't really see anybody. But, you know, maybe you'll be so inspired by this that you will go home and find your Pachuchka night and become um, a Pachuchka devotee. And, you know, really, all over the world, Pachuchka happens. So what we want to try and do in this vast auditorium, okay, with a lot of empty space, we want to kind of create a little bit of spirit of Pachuchka. So we're going to give you a question, okay? Talk to the person next to you. I'm just going to give you about three minutes. What, say hello, if you don't know them, and answer the question or talk together, what would it take for you to make a presentation, in your total presentation, in six minutes, 40 seconds? And um, say hello to the person next to you. I'm going to move us on. How, how many of you are up for the challenge? How many of us are up to the challenge of uh, doing a presentation in, in, uh, in six minutes, 40 seconds? Who's interested in doing this? Yeah, quite a few. Okay. So you're going to see this done very, very well. But one final um, thing from me. These are our eight presenters and from all over the world, from very different contexts. I'll introduce them properly one by one. And, you know, what, what I think all our colleagues here are going to demonstrate is what we call the holy triad, okay, the three aspects of a truly great presentation. Number one, be brief so that you don't send your audience to sleep. Number two, be brilliant. And we have got some fantastic content. And number three, be gone. <laughs> so we're going to see plenty of that. So let's get on to our first speaker. Our first speaker is Emma, Emma Donaldson, and Emma is from Salford, Salford Royal um, Hospital in England and is the clinical lead for quality improvement. So, as soon as I, I've got control, because as, as, as soon as I click the clicker, she had the first 20 seconds starts. So, Emma, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Right, let's go. Hi, and uh, as uh, Helen said, my name's Emma Donaldson. I'm a consultant gastroenterologist and the clinical director for quality improvement in Salford uh, in the UK. And I'm just going to take six minutes and 40 seconds to take you through my quality improvement journey as a trainee and how that's influencing what I do now. 
So this is me in 2003. I was starting off as a, a specialist trainee, trying really hard to deliver excellent care to my patients. And there were blips and problems and challenges with the service, but that just is part of the job and something you deal with. But then everything started to change. This is me in 2006. I was diagnosed with breast cancer, and I went from being a healthcare professional to a patient. And I discovered that all those little blips in healthcare are actually really fundamentally important to patients. Because the things that mattered to me while I was dealing with my cancer were the little things. Could I email my consultant and ask a question and get a response? Could I plan my treatment sessions around going to work? And I discovered that those things were A, thought to be very unusual, and B, incredibly difficult to achieve. So when I came back into clinical training, I felt lost and perplexed and confused because what I thought was the acceptable status quo quite clearly wasn't an acceptable status quo. So what do I do? I'm just a trainee. I have no power, no seniority. So then in all great things in healthcare came an opportunity, and that for me was in 2008. I came back to clinical practice and rotated to Salford at the start of its improvement journey, and I got sent to a quality improvement collaborative meeting because my boss was too busy to go. And I got roped into taking part in the Acutely Unwell Adults project, and there I am, looking younger in the corner. And I got to work with a great team of doctors and nurses and ward clerks and domestics looking to reduce cardiac arrests. And I discovered I could do that as a trainee, that I had ideas that could change things, and it didn't matter who I was. And this was one sunny day in Salford, and there aren't very many of them. And we released balloons that represent the patient who didn't have a cardiac arrest as a, as a result of that piece of work, because we reduced cardiac arrests in our hospital by half. So I've now been involved in a great project so then I took a leap of faith, and in 2009, I came out of clinical training to work in the Quality Improvement Directorate at Salford for the next four years, because that was how I was going to get from where I was to where I wanted to be as a healthcare improver. And in doing that, I had fantastic opportunities. I've been involved in building capability in the Organisation for Improvement for the last four years. I've facilitated 40 plus senior-led teams delivering quality improvement projects. Here they are learning to work together uh, using PDSA cycles. And as a result of that, saw amazing changes to patient care. I saw teams halve central line infections in neonates, resulting in babies going home who would have died. I saw waiting time for complex services reduced from over two weeks to less than two days using quality improvement. And then I took a step back and looked around and discovered that the trainees in the organization were just as lost and confused as I had been. And the reason for that was that they could see improvement was important, that it was going on all around them, but had no idea how to access that. And what we sort of observed about trainees is that they were apart from the team. So clinically, they were part of a team, but the improvement teams were made up of permanent staff and trainees in the UK rotate between hospitals. They're temporary. They don't have a permanent role, so they don't exist in those teams. And that led me to get together with some other trainees to develop Tickle. And Tickle is trainees improving care through leadership and education. And what I'm going to talk you through is the five steps that we've used to try and address some of these problems for trainees. And we've taken lessons from social media and how do they encourage people to move from watching to taking part. And the first lesson is to make it easier. It's easier to take part in quality improvement if you know what quality improvement is. And so we teach. We teach methodology, we teach reliability, we teach human factors, we teach data and measurement for improvement. We give them the knowledge. The second thing is to try and make participation a side effect. So being aware of what's going on on your patch. So just by virtue of being the surgical junior doctor, you can be part of surgical improvement work. So just by being there, 
allows you to participate. It's not something special that you have to do as an added extra. Edit a system that they already know. So quality improvement isn't something big and new and scary. It's just an add-on to the audit cycle that you're already familiar with. So rather than presenting a slide of recommendations, take that forward and be the change. Deliver the change yourself as a quality improvement project. Seeing improvements in patient care is reward enough for itself, but a glossy certificate for your portfolio that you can use at your end of year appraisal and for job interviews is also goes a long way to encouraging participation. And if you're an excellent participant, a quality contributor, then we reward you. And we reward you by putting you on the committee so that you can organise it next year. We give you a voice at the executive table to account for the activity of trainees in the organisation. We encourage people to present at conferences like this and come and get a wider perspective. And I think in summary, I'd say that life is a one-time offer, so use it well. Healthcare professionals spend a huge amount of time in training, and that time can be used to make a real difference. So why wait until you're senior and uh, very experienced to make a difference, you can do it today. Thank you. Emma, that is such a wonderful story, and I think it, um, it, you know, it gives us such um, hope of what's possible, I think, at a human and individual level, but also at an organisational level. Thank you. So our next speaker is um, Cheryl. I'm really terrified, you know, because I've got complete control of the auto runs. And if I press one button wrong, the whole thing goes into havoc. So I'm taking my responsibilities very seriously. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so um, Cheryl Gelman, who is Professor of Public Health at Portland State University. So, Cheryl, are you ready? I am ready. Right, I'm pressing the button now. Building knowledge of improvement is an essential element in training junior doctors or medical residents. In Portland, Oregon, USA, the Oregon Health and Science University Family Medicine Residency Program collaborates with Portland State University to provide theory-based expert teaching complemented by clinical application. The curriculum is grounded in the triple aim, in particular because our state of Oregon has committed to this framework as the foundation for its health system transformation. We use the model of improvement as our preferred approach for helping learners to gain foundational knowledge and tools and be able to apply these in practice. We've been offering this curriculum for eight years and have learned that it is essential to balance the needs of learners. Professional mastery of improvement is vital to health professionals' work, but physician training must also respond to accreditation requirements. It is necessary to integrate improvement learning and practice into the residents' experiences to develop competencies in patient care. This longitudinal curriculum starts with an emphasis on personal improvement, builds to integration of clinical improvement skills, and culminates with leadership development. Throughout, residents work in cross-year teams on clinic-based improvement projects in the ambulatory clinic setting, with more senior trainees mentoring those more junior. A unique feature of this curriculum is the time designated for improvement learning. Consider the hours of dedicated curriculum time, independent project work, and both team and individual work on the clinic-based improvement project, and the aggregate is 228 person days, or 46 weeks per year. While the actual curriculum time is not that great, what is impressive is the total investment. So if you can inc integrate improvement in your daily life, you can apply theory and practice. First-year trainees welcome an assignment to have fun and work on a personal priority in the midst of an intense year. By working on diet, weight, housekeeping, or exercise, they create the foundation to make improvement part of professional work. Each year, the 12-person resident teams in the three ambulatory family medicine clinics pick an improvement focus. They apply the model for improvement, practice using various tools, and run through multiple PDSA cycles to test hunches and make real improvements. They use various improvement tools, creating a flowchart, logging frequency of an activity, or understanding variation over time helps them to identify subsequent actions for improvement. Project topics have included improving communication, enhancing prescribing practices, and better managing the health needs of complex patients. Coaches are key to the learning process. They must understand how to sit back and monitor, and when to jump in and guide. They attend the monthly clinic-based work sessions, 
serve as a resource, and access a library we have created of just-in-time teaching materials. Coaches are not the most senior clinicians, but instead have demonstrated exper expertise in improvement and willingness to be present and hands-on. Accountability is essential to keep the clinic-based improvement projects on track throughout the year. Residents check in monthly with the coach. Coaches check in monthly with the lead faculty and share ideas and challenges. Teams make a mid-year presentation to all residents and faculty, and final presentations are made at a department-wide conference at the end of the year. We've conducted a systematic evaluation of the curriculum, employing a robust set of methods for the past six years. Residents complete a structured anonymous survey annually. Focus groups obtain feedback on the class-specific didactic sessions, and we regularly observe the residents in their teams and provide feedback on presentations. One year, we noticed a considerable dip in the percent of learners satisfied with the teaching of improvement. This caused us to pause, reflect, and identify opportunities for improvement. We redesigned selected curriculum aspects to respond to learner feedback, and since then have seen increased learner satisfaction. We observe how learners have mastered key concepts in their projects. As an educator, I notice that some trainees are very sophisticated in the use of these methods, and others need basic assistance in understanding data collection, charting, and use of tools such as Excel, skills not necessarily learned in medical school. The trainees do develop considerable expertise in systems and process thinking, usually best learned by sitting down together, working through a problem, and then mapping their knowledge of a process. This slide shows early work on improving vaccination rates. The team first had to understand all the parts of the process before it could design a plan. Residents frequently surprise themselves in their ability to make change. They don't always succeed, but they learn from failure. When they do achieve their goals, they are ecstatic. This example shows dramatic improvements in pertussis vaccination rates in 10 months at one clinic. When one group succeeds, it's infectious and motivates the others to work harder towards their goals. The spread of these projects has also been impressive. Resident projects have been picked up by all faculty at a clinic and then spread citywide across the entire family medicine department. Policies have spread across the hospital and become a city or statewide public health practice. Our improvement curriculum is serving as a role model across other postgraduate programs locally and now hopefully to many of you. The role of faculty as coach and role model is critical. Our faculty coaches have a unique skill set with the right knowledge and experience. They've had intensive training and improvement as part of an MPH curriculum and are adept at applying theory in the practice setting. The coaches report a high level of satisfaction with their roles as teachers. The residents need permission to work on topics that are relevant to them. Clinic priorities may be important to the faculty, but the residents will engage when they perceive the work will benefit their well-being and their ability to deliver high-quality patient care. Improvement must be framed as core to daily work. It cannot be a standalone topic, and integration makes this relevant. Our senior residents are encouraged to submit to the IHI National Forum, and increasingly we find that others are voluntarily submitting and presenting to various IHI or family medicine meetings. A clinic team recently won first place for their improvement poster at a local forum, and one of our coaches won second place for a poster he is also presenting here in Paris. This systematic longitudinal curriculum is effective for doctors in training. The curriculum builds incrementally over the years and is relevant to the level of learner. We create a culture of improvement, build knowledge and competencies, and balance learner-relevant training with collaborative clinic-based experiences that will improve patient care. Thank you. I think that was another tour de force. Can you imagine if that kind of hardwired quality learning system was built in um, with, with university um, education across the world? What a difference it would make. That was really amazing. So um, thank you, Cheryl. So you can see why we like Pachuchka, can't you? It's very, um, it's very interesting and um, uh, entertaining, and it really keeps you um, focused. So we're going to come back to this side of the Atlantic now. And I'm really um, pleased to introduce Imran Karashi, and Imran is going to tell you about DAPS. Actually, I won't even explain what DAPS is, I'll let you explain it. So, are you ready for your first slide, Imran? Uh, I think so, yeah. Okay, go for it. 
Um, right, so I'm not really here to tell you about The Hobbit. Um, I'm actually here to tell you about my unexpected journey. Um, and, and really, very much like the central character, Bilbo Baggins, in The Hobbit, who had this journey thrust upon him. It sort of wasn't thrust upon me, but I, it came out of nowhere, really. I didn't really expect to see it. Um, and really, what this talk is about is, is, is about the story of my journey. So my name's Imran. I am the founder of this organization, DAPS Global, Doctors Advancing Patient Safety. By training, I'm a microbiology uh, doctor and I was the previous clinical lead for BMJ Quality. Um, so um, w the things that I'm going to really mention is about how this all sort of took off and, and, and where it really started from. So the story really begins um, in 2009 when I attended, quite unexpectedly, uh, the International Forum on Quality and Safety in Berlin. And I uh, met Gandalf, uh, who at that time was Don Berwick, um, and he really, uh, within 45 minutes, about talking about patient centeredness turned up turned my whole perspective of quality on, on its head and really challenged lots of my ideas, as did other healthcare professionals. So I went back to the local tavern where I was staying, um, and um, I had a piece of notepad, and I was really excited by all of the ideas that I'd heard, and I thought, how can I, as a junior doctor, make some real change in what's happening, and how can, how, how can we be a, a force? So I wrote these four letters, DAPS, uh, on the paper, and that's really where DAPS was born. Um, and I went back to my local trust, which was Ashford and St. Peter's, and I went to all the very, very junior doctors, and I said to them, How, what do you think about improving care from the front line? They all went, yay, let's do that. And I was like, great. Um, and, it, and it often happens that everybody's very enthusiastic. So I went to see the medical director, who's the chap in the middle, and the chief exec, who's the chap on the right, uh, and they were like, this is a great idea, we must go and do it. So um, as part of my training, I get to rotate between different hospitals. So I've rotated between lots of these different hospitals, and I've been doing a QI program, a quality improvement program, sorry, very similar to what um, Emma and Cheryl have just presented. Um, and I'm still learning about how to make that better. I mean, we've had lots of trainees uh, doing projects, and this is an example of one of our trainees, Will Barker, who recognized a problem that whenever he used to move rotations, he didn't know what to do in the next job, and he thought, this is a really inefficient way of working. So he designed a website where junior doctors from hospitals can put up all their information about how to do tasks, and I know that there's a poster here as well regarding it. So we, uh, our program's been running for five years. It's been doing really well. We've had over 250 junior doctors getting involved. Um, we've presented this internationally a few times, and we've just launched it in Brisbane in Australia last week with my colleagues, uh, Dr. Agatha Nortney meshi She went out and she launched it there in Brisbane. We're hopefully going to be taking it to the Middle East sometime later this year. One of the great things that we've learned, actually, about junior doctors uh, and medical students is that they are like, you know, like we learn differently. So we may be a visual learner, an, uh, an auditory learner, or a kinesthetic learner. They like to do QI differently as well, you know, and it's, you know, in the end, when you think about it, it's really no surprise. Um, so we thought, how can we engage, you know, all of the workforce in, in, in getting involved? So what we did was we took seven junior doctors to a hospital in Lahore in Pakistan, uh, and we got them to work with seven junior doctors there. Um, and we were there for 10 days, and they worked on quality improvement projects. So they went around the hospital and they thought, what really needs to be improved? And they worked on three particular projects. So the first project was about improving infection control. And the second project was about reclaiming the use of the uh, drug, the cardiac arrest trolleys, which were being used as normal sort of pharmaceutical stores um, and getting sort of the emergency medications back in there. And the third project, which is perhaps my favorite and the most important, was designing a bespoke uh, medication discharge form for patients who are illiterate, which was over 50% of the population. Um, another thing that we learned really was that junior doctors of all types, and the vast majority of them, rather unfortunately, are extrinsically motivated, meaning that they want to get involved in quality because it suits a purpose, it gets them a better job, or it's better for their CV, or whatever it is. But we're really interested in, also in the intrinsic motivators, because these, we feel, really are the healthcare leaders of the future. And for them, we designed what's called the summer school. So um, every year, and this is going to be our third year doing it, we run a, a three-day course. Uh, it's not really a course, it's really a get-together of really impressive minds uh, across the country, and we've had international delegates as well, uh, 30 people doing pure healthcare innovation, and they really come up with some really fantastic stuff. We do a whole range of things, and some of them are on the slides. So we get them to design campaigns, we get them to design um, iPhone apps, uh, be part of workshops, get involved with debates, and the, the stuff which is called Thank You For, this was a campaign that they set up which was um, highlighted on NHS Change Day, which Damien will be telling you about later. Um, so we really do get them to do a lot of stuff. 
Um, an important thing that we've realized is that you need to get people early. It's no point getting them towards the end of their career when it's all just a bit too late. So we really do try to instill this right from the word go. We do teaching for first year healthcare students, not just medical students, but all healthcare students. They do audits uh, and they write essays for us as well. Uh, and really it's important to get them early. Um, and here are some of the examples of some of the audits that some of the senior students have done and some of the essays that um, some of our more junior colleagues have done as well. And there's a whole range of topics there that you can see. And many of these are picked by themselves. They have an interest in these things and they want to talk and write about them. And it's been a great success getting involved in a very junior level. Uh, I suppose the natural progression of our organization is that now that we've been doing this for five years, we thought, well, we really need a conference that gets together all of the junior doctor minds and really just talking, focusing on junior doctors and medical students. So in November of this year, we're going to be holding our first uh, DAPS Global Summit, uh, which will be in Nottingham in the UK, but everybody is invited. Um, so yeah, looking forward to seeing you there. So what is the future? Every great story has a sequel. Every great story has you know, a way to go. And I think that's where we're, what, we're, what we're looking at now. Uh, and, and one of the things that we're looking at um, is, is healthcare innovation you know, confined to healthcare individuals? Are we the best people to do healthcare innovation? Can other people get involved? So at the end of this year, we're going to start running two projects with a university um, and a high school, if that's probably the most generic term I can use, uh, where we're going to get students who are not healthcare students to... Um, get involved in healthcare innovation, we're going to set them a problem and say, we need you to solve this. So that's going to be a really interesting thing uh, to look forward to as part of our future development. And just as I started, I want to end with The Hobbit as well. And I really like this quote from The Hobbit. There is more, of, there is more in you of good than you know, kind, child of the kindly West. Some courage and some wisdom blended in measure. If more of us valued food and cheer and song above hoarded gold, it would be a merrier world. Uh, that really is the wisdom that I'd like to pass on to you, that actually, you know, what it takes, quality takes courage and wisdom. It really does. And I hope that that is what we can work together for. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Imran. And again, I think you are an absolute role model of um, intrinsic motivation and, and how it can really um, change the world. So next, we have Margaret Schneider. And Margaret is from Utrecht in the Netherlands. And she's Professor of Internal Medicine and Chair of the Division of Internal Medicine and um, Dermatology. So are you ready to go, Margaret? Oh, wait a moment. Yes, <laughs> OK. The button gets pressed now. Yes. I would like to thank the program committee for inviting me and Helen Bevan for thoroughly training me for this kind of session. In daily work, I not only uh, am a program director of the internal residence, but also an ambassador of quality and safety, and I chair the division. And I would like to ask you, do you ever wonder why? When was the last time you asked your students or your junior doctors why things organized the way they are, and if they ever wonder, and uh, what would they like to change first if they had a chance? And should they wonder why? Yes, I think you should. With the rise of clinical manage management, new skills of medical doctors stand out, including leadership. Medical professionals must organize medical work and improvement of care. The training of so so-called frontline leadership skills are weekly developed in our residency programs. Wonder and improve sessions value the critical minds of residents and make them aware of their responsibility and accountability for the organization of their daily practice. To experience ownership and empowerment, we offer them tools. The emphasis on leadership is in the so-called KenMeds model for training residents. This model adds competencies to traditional medical skills like diagnosing and treating diseases. Mountford and Webb of McKinsey discriminate three kinds of leaders. Institutional leaders, which execute formal leadership and steward whole organizations. Service leaders, who lead their own services within the context of their organization. And frontline leaders. That's our us, every clinician who focuses on delivering excellent direct patient care. And because the training of leaderships is weekly developed, we started to look for ways to train our residents and make them aware of frontline leadership. And to, we invented a basic uh, practice-based learning method to earn, learn them ownership and empower them. 
What is Wonderanium Proof? How does it work? Residents are invited in a one-hour quality improvement session, during which they list their critical experiences with patient treatment and care provisions. They attend voluntary, and the chair is, uh, uh, is done by the program director. And how does it work? It's a specific format. First, an update and progress of the improvements of uh, former projects. And then, in small groups, the residents come up with new surprising critical items. It's important these items are in the reach of improvement of the residents themselves. They prioritize and choose the most four, three or four important subjects. Then, the residents volunteer and are dedicated and formulate smart goals. For example, a resident wondered why nurses keep coming to me for non-urgent questions about their patients after clinical rounds. I'm losing focus, all those interruptions. She shared it, it got prioritized, and then they went for change. What changed? The residents arranged a meeting with the nurse's manager and a supervisor, and they agreed to introduce a moment for the nurses to ask their non-urgent questions. Moreover, the junior nurses said they would go first to their supervisor for help before asking the doctor's advice. What were other examples for change? A read-back procedure for telephone orders and urgent calls. A two-day ATLS training for, res for first-year residents. Redesign of clinical rounds for privacy issues. Uniform dress code and upspeeding admittance procedures from the ER room to the wards. Because this method was adopted by many colleagues, nowadays 16 resident programs joining us, we started a research program during a six month period. And we used an interpretive qualitative study design using observations, interviews, document analysis and evaluation forms. A total of 13 sessions were ev evaluated identifying 114 improvement projects. We categorized them in the six aims of quality improvement. And most of these points relate to organizational and technical factors as efficiency and safety. And what are the most important effects on the residents themselves, personal effects? A lot of enthusiasm. And they became aware that they are part of the changing process and not subjected to it. They discovered their position in hospital, their responsibility, and their affinity and skills. And as a consequence, they felt being heard, being taken seriously, being supported and better equipped. In short, they felt ownership and empowerment. And they said the simple fact that there is attention from supervisors for my problems gives me the courage to keep on going and keep improving. This practice-based learning method accords with the educational learning in which Thiessen proposed the universal needs for learning. Autonomy, I'm able to choose. Relation, collaboration, I'm sharing, I'm not alone. And competency, I can do it, I'm proud of it. So in conclusion, Wonder and Improvement is a practice-based learning method to create awareness, ownership and empowerment of residents they need it for exhibiting frontline leader leadership, and we should start as early as possible. Last but not least, I want to thank my colleagues in research and putting the program forward, which is Lisbeth van Wensen in my hospital and Mirko Nordegraaf from the Utah School of Governance. And of course, all the residents and program directors who are so enthusiastic in spreading the word. Thank you. Again, Margaret, I think that was a real kind of masterclass in the kind of approach to learning that is like hardwired in. And, and you know, I think um, lots of people are very envious of that. And um, we always knew that the world had to learn from the Netherlands. And, um, and you were a wonderful role model of that. So here we've got Michelle, Michelle Mello. And Michelle is the head of commissioning for nursing at NHS England. And are you ready? I'm ready to go. 
Right, so I'm going to press the button okay. now. Hello, my name is Michelle. Um, I'm a nurse. I'm proud to be a nurse. I work in the Chief Nursing Officers team in the NHS, the National Health Service in England. And I'm delighted to be able to talk to you today about a group of emerging clinical leaders called Care Makers. I'm going to share with you where the idea, idea for Care Makers came from, how the concept and the program has developed, and the impact that the, the impact that Care Makers has had, as well as just share some reflections with you and some learning from along the way. This group of people are amazing. So, we were very proud in the UK to host the Olympics and the Paralympics in 2012. The Games brought people together, created a sense of hope and a real spirit of possibility. We even saw the NHS celebrated in the opening ceremony and we wanted to build on this. One of the key features of the Games was the volunteer role played by the Games makers. Forget people talking about going to see Usain Bolt. The thing they talked about was the brilliant Games makers at the Olympics. And we wanted to see if we could take this volunteering concept to use it to drive improvements in healthcare. Around about the same time, our chief nurse launched a new nursing strategy called Compassion in Practice. And this is based on the six C's. These are care, compassion, competence, communication, courage, and commitment. These are the values and behaviours that underpin excellence in nursing care. So, we wanted to build on the volunteering legacy, the idea of commitment to embed the six C's and drive improvement locally at the direct patient care level. So we asked students and newly qualified nurses to help us launch the six C's at the Chief Nurses Conference in December 2012. At the time, we selected 50 people on the basis of experience that they've had of being volunteers, commitment to the six C's, and a real desire to drive improvement in patient care and staff experience. And some of those first care makers had been Olympic Games makers. We also wanted to do something a bit different with social media. So we set up a virtual web space, a, a Twitter account, and a Facebook page. And we also worked with We Nurses, which is a virtual nursing network on Twitter, which has over 16,000 followers. And just to give you an idea of some of the statistics and the reach that we've had with social media, we have over 2,000 people following the, the, our Twitter account. And in a recent tweet chat, you can see the word cloud there, we made over 2.5 million Twitter impressions. And we have about 600 people actively engaged on the Facebook page. As well as supporting people virtually, we also thought it was really important to give them some one-to-one -one and face-to-face -face time. So we do an induction for groups of care makers. This is cohort three. And this has been really important in terms of setting expectations, helping people to connect, and also plan their uh, improvement in practice. The induction's based on care makers as change agents. We, we focus on personal resilience and how to be effective healthcare radicals, rocking the boat but staying in it. And this is really important when they go back to practice to make the change. It really helps them. And it's just been fantastic to see care makers grow personally and professionally. And I just love this quote from Lisa, one of our care makers. She says, I've had a fantastic year. It's like a ma magic wand being waved in our organization. It has put the excitement back into nursing. And that's just fantastic. So now we have over 1,000 care makers. The program has spread by word of mouth, as well as social media and conventional methods. And we have care makers in a whole range of settings, including hospitals, out in the community, from mental health backgrounds, and also working in the voluntary sector, such as hospices. This year, we've launched a clinical research program. We've developed a care maker app to connect people better digitally. And we also have a national award that we've launched. So it's been a pretty busy year. In terms of impact that the care makers have had on direct patient care, they are acting as role models and, amb and ambassadors for the six C's at the direct patient level. They are helping to transform culture by embedding the six C's locally. 
and we've collected some of their stories together on the virtual website and also through social media. So we now have over 400 examples of improvements that care makers have made in practice. And these range from individual changes to teams working together to the six Cs being adopted and embedded across organizations and also across educational curriculum. So a great impact. And the concept grows. So we now have care makers who, that range right across the nursing family from healthcare, from nursing assistants, through to the most senior nurses, directors of nursing and organizations. And also we have our first other clinicians, so doctors um, and therapists who are care makers too. So we had an idea um, and we just went with it. Initially, we didn't know where this was going to go. And I think when you're working in quality improvement, that's what you've got to do. You've just got to take that leap, take that first step, and just see how things go. And, you know, it, it's been a great experience. My other reflection would be that there is still huge potential amongst cl clinical staff to drive quality improvement. If you can connect with people's values around a shared purpose that they believe in and give them some support, it can make a real difference to direct patient care. So we have our group of our cohort of 1,000 care makers. We need to work with them to strengthen the evidence about their impact, and we need to continue to support them in their improvement journey. But wouldn't it be great if we could see care makers in every healthcare provider, all different types of clinicians right across the UK? Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And again, I think another great story. You know, in, in England, one of the issues for us is when we've gone and we've talked to frontline clinical staff about, you know, the main reason why you're not getting involved in quality improvement, the, the, the main thing that comes back is we don't feel we've got permission. And, and I think, you know, being part of a movement like the care makers just gives a fantastic sense of permission. So, gosh, that's gone so quickly. So, um, yeah, we're in the kind of second half of our, we're in the second half of our speakers now. So I'm really pleased to introduce Emma, Emma Volks. And Emma is from the Royal Berkshire NHS Foundation Trust in England and is a consultant nephrologist and the Director of Quality Improvement. So are you ready for your first slide, Emma? I am. Right, here we go. Making every moment count is all about enhancing the training of our junior doctors by giving them the opportunity in a supported environment to learn, develop and embed new skills in quality improvement methodology and put them into practice so they experience experiential learning as well as them showing them how they can directly improve patient care. We felt trainees bring a unique perspective to our hospital and are a rich resource of fresh eyes and ideas that can make a real difference to patient care. This has not been working with traditional clinical audit and a lot of data collection. We wanted to show them how they could put these opportunities into real-time improvement change. So the aims of the pilot were to make every moment count by embedding quality improvement as normal practice, provide high-quality training in a quality improvement methodology for the trainee and for the multidisciplinary team within which they work, and put this into effective action and have the appropriate resources. The pilot ran over one year and was targeted at trainees of all specialties and all grades in one hospital. The model for improvement was both the framework for the pilot itself and the methodology used by the trainees for their projects, and the Kirkpatrick model of training was used for evaluation. The goal was to identify 30 cross-specialty trainees to undertake facilitated quality improvement projects. The ideas for each project could be trainee-inspired or generated through learning from the simulated environment from complaints and clinical incidents. They are encouraged to work together and with the multidisciplinary team. The resources needed to support such a programme of work were identified in terms of manpower and financial cost, but also to enable the trainees and their supervisors to hit the ground running and feel supported in putting their ideas into action. These included practical quality improvement training toolkits and e-learning. There was a central project team of three where this pilot became absorbed as part of our usual work. 
We were supported by a multidisciplinary project board with patient representation. It was really important that this was not just seen as something new for the junior doctors, but for all our staff. The project was felt to be an, a success. It wasn't just 30 trainees, it was 45 trainees that undertook 27 projects, some working together, all working with members of their multidisciplinary teams, and some with active involvement of patients and carers and everyone was satisfied with their learning experience. There was a positive shift in attitudes towards implementing service improvement. All the consultant supervisors agreed the objectives of the projects were met, that there was a significant impact, and it had been a valuable learning experience, and they even agreed that they would supervise a future project. Three independent assessors scored the learning and the quality impact of the trainees and their projects, this demonstrated the acquisition of new knowledge by the trainees in both de delivering and completing their projects, but they had also acquired new skills to the standard expected of their stage of training, even exceeding it. I think the behaviour change is summed up by this quote, my whole outlook has changed, I now look for situations to improve. 38 of the 45 trainees are now doing quality improvement projects in other hospitals. And it's beyond the junior doctor. It's also a change seen in, with the nurses. So was there a benefit to the hospital and to the patients? 74% achieved their project aims. And the projects were evaluated to have had a positive impact on organizational practice. One example was embedding in preoperative assessment a patient-guided DVD to reduce anxiety prior to an anesthetic. And they were evaluated to have had a positive impact on patient care. One example was the use of long-term peritoneal drains in patients with malignant recurrent ascites, which changed the lives of 12 patients. And another was the improved experience of children with cystic fibrosis. The potential for return on investment was both financial and non-financial, the human cost. But only four of the 27 projects actually realized any financial benefit with the project, within the project lifespan. It was identified it was either too soon or probably more relevant, we hadn't really identified that potential from the start. Other training resources were developed. The filming of simulated patient safety scenarios to enable root cause analysis training and debrief training. And a quality improvement challenge toolkit around an inquest scenario enabling uh, trainees to take on hospital roles and interact with the press and the coroner and patients. There was an awful lot of learning. How do you engage and communicate with the trainees when they have a lot of competing demands? And we use many different methods to try and engage them. Email, texting, phones, newsletters. The importance of central support was critical. This approach needs to be seen as core hospital business. It becomes a win-win. The doctors and the wider staff develop new skills, but the organization benefits from quality improvement in practice and improved patient care. A core team provides the momentum. It's important to have a pool of project ideas and consultant supervisors that the central team can link trainees with, and to encourage the multidisciplinary team working, and if possible, patient involvement, and to consider the prize incentives so people can showcase their work. The pilot methodology was intentionally designed and the required resources developed so as to be readily cascadable and straightforward to adopt outside our own hospital without um, too much other financial or personal burden. And the multidisciplinary team and patient involvement is key to sustainability. By providing a robust structured framework of quality improvement methodology and an infrastructure of support Trainees of all grades and all specialties can learn new skills in the science of improvement and put it into practice. Doctors in training can make every moment count to improve the quality and safety of patient care now and in the future. Um, thanks, Emma. I wish that all quality improvement learning programmes were... Um, as, as well followed up and articulated as that. So, 
Our next speaker is Damien Rowland, and Damien is from Leicester and England, and he is a consultant and lecturer in paediatric emergency medicine. So, are you ready for your moment, <laughs> Damien? Here we go. Hello, my name is Damien. In May 2012, my daughter was admitted to hospital with query meningitis. It was during that time that I saw the best the National Health Service, the NHS, had to offer care, skills, aptitude, but also the worst, hierarchy, uh, problems with communication. And it was then I realized that the real problems that the NHS was having, we had the Francis Report looming, uh, an in-depth inquiry into a troubled hospital which showed that there were real difficulties with compassion and leadership. What could be done to change this? We needed a different status quo. And if you don't change the direction that you're going in, you will end up where you're heading. So it was with this that I had a fortuitous conversation with Helen Bevan. And we thought about a sustainable improvement initiative which would reach a new generation of healthcare professionals. And it wasn't as if people weren't trying. It's just that engagement wasn't good. It was a bit top-down. It was bureaucratic. It was British. Um, and that the problem was is that we had really nowhere to go, and we'd missed a really great pool, a great army of people who were out there, and those were junior doctors, nurses, student nurses, other allied healthcare professionals, people who were really chomping at the bit, wanting to get involved, but had never really been given the permission to do so. They wanted change, but just weren't able to, to grab it, as it were. And so we had an idea. We would set up one day. One day, it was the 13th of March, 2013, where we would ask people to pledge to do something. Doesn't matter what it was, it could be anything, it could happen anywhere but one little or big thing that would change your practice or improve patient experience. And so NHS Change Day was born. And it was in that year was the 65th birthday of the NHS. So, because it was the 65th year, we went for 65,000 pledges. A, a ridiculous total. But it was something that we were really felt passionately that we could achieve. And anyone could pledge. And they could pledge whatever they wanted, and it didn't really matter. We had cleaners to chief executives. We had ophthalmologists to occupational therapists getting involved and just doing little things. Pledges involved, sitting on a wheelchair for, for a day. We had a rock band pledging not to encourage people to stage dive into the audience. But we also learned a lot. And Thomas Edison said, I, I, I never failed at anything at all. I just learned a thousand ways that, of, of doing things that weren't right. And one of the things that I, I want to express now is some of the learning that we had from this experience. And the first thing is the importance of narrative. My, my pledge for the first change day was to try some pediatric antibiotics. Oh, one of them was absolutely disgusting. And it's really changed the way I rationalize my prescriptions. The other to lie on a spinal board, collar and cuff for an hour. It was a frightening, uncomfortable experience, and I'm an adult. Imagine what it would be like if you were a child. But it's that authenticity that's important as well. I'm a paediatrician. I'm passionate about the care of the ill and injured child. But, but actually, yes, I might be able to talk about DVT prophylaxis in adults, but that's not really my thing. So be authentic. Be true to who you are. But also, you must be the change that you want to see. You must really stand up for kind of what you believe in. And as the Change Day team did, we, we all pledged. We actually all believed that the individual pledges would be so much bigger together than the sum of their parts. And it's so important uh, to, to practice what you preach. And we were lone nuts. And it was absolutely vital that we acknowledge those who joined this journey with us. To be honest, it might have been a good idea. We might have demonstrated good leadership. We might have had good engagement. But we would have been nothing without the people who went out there and actually pledged. I also personally recognize a different type of radical. Neville Longbottom is a real hero of the Harry Potter series because he just goes about his business. He doesn't ask for rewards. He's a bit of a geek, yes, but he just does it. And actually, there are lots of Neville Longbottoms out there in health services, and we need to celebrate them. 
We do also need to acknowledge that although this was a fantastic bottom-up exercise, we did need organizational support. And actually, the trusts that were most involved were ones where the chief executives and the boards on board. Chief executive of Birmingham pledging to read bedtime stories to her patients at night. Social media. Now, you may hate Twitter. You may hate LinkedIn. Well, to be honest, uh, at, at some levels, we need to start embracing the fact that other people are using it. There are stories to be told, and social media is a fantastic way of telling stories. And wow, did NHS Change Day collect those stories and tell them. And through that medium, we had Alice Cole King with her You Can Cope campaign. Kate Granger, Hello My Name Is, the Thank You campaign that's already been mentioned. These were initiatives that came out of social media that enable people to join a pledge even if they couldn't think of one to do themselves. And so we were on a, a journey of improvement, but most of all about the patient. And for the first change day, we reached 179,000 pledges. Remember I said our goal was 65,000. For this year on the 3rd of March, we went for half a million, a, a, a huge total, but we made it. Okay, it was a, an aspiration, an aspiration to demonstrate the achievement that healthcare professionals could make. But ultimately, that is just a number. It's a number that sits on a screen and it looks quite nice. But my real belief, my real hope for Change Day is actually what we've done is we've empowered healthcare professionals to think about how they can improve and change themselves. So that when they see patients, or that when my daughter who is now well goes back into hospital, she will be seen by someone who really understands what care means. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Damien. And I think this whole theme about intrinsic motivation, you know, people getting engaged in quality improvement because they want to, because it connects with like, who they are in the world, not because they have to, is a, is a very strong theme amongst our speakers. So I can't believe we've reached the very last speaker. That's gone so quickly. So um, I'd like to introduce um, Kim Oates. And Kim is from Australia and is the Director of Undergraduate Quality and Safety Education at the Clinical Excellence Committee. So, Kim, are you ready? I am. Right, let's go. So this presentation is about identifying uh, future leaders in patient safety, and I've described myself as a paediatrician, an academic, and a grandfather. Why is that? Is that because I'm a grand proud grandfather? Well, I certainly am. But for this presentation, there's more to it. In Australia, many of the leaders in patient safety are wonderful, highly experienced people, but there's one problem. Most tend to be, if I can put it politely, of a fairly mature age. Um, the average age is around 62. Where are the new leaders going to come from? There's no shortage of talent in health. We need to harness that talent, find young people with an interest in pa patient safety, and nurture them and stimulate them. The Clinical Excellence Commission, where I work, was established to improve quality across the state. My role there is to infiltrate medical schools to get them to provide more quality and patient safety teaching. That's my job. I'm the infiltrator. And I also decided that it might be worth infiltrating allied health and nursing schools as well. Although medicine's improved a lot since the 16th century, it's still an apprenticeship model. It requires tutors and role models. My job was to convince medical schools to include patient safety teaching and then to provide it in a way that was enjoyable and useful. And I really hoped that some students would be really switched on and want to learn more. So we did a national survey um, looking at patient safety teaching in Australian universities. 70% of deans said there was a lot of it, but only 42% of their medical educators agreed, and 78% of medical students said there wasn't much patient safety at all. So clearly, there was much to do. The program's now taught in four medical schools, in two nursing schools, and one school of allied health. And the format's pretty similar for them all. We do a 30 to 40 minute interactive presentation, and then breakout groups with tutors for small group discussions, and then they come back uh, to, to discuss their presentation about the clinical problem that they've discussed. In first year, we discuss why errors occur, blame cultures, safe cultures, uh, 
We also discuss hand washing and leadership. Now, why on earth do I put leadership and hand washing together? Well, frankly, I don't find hand washing very exciting, but leadership is exciting. And so we teach them the skills of leadership and then give them a clinical problem about hand washing to try to solve. In second year, we look at human factors, open disclosure, teams and communication, and the patient as part of the care team. In the teams and communication, we look at civil disasters, such as the Tenerife air crash, and to discuss where things went wrong because of poor communication and then get the students to discuss clinical problems where poor communication also led to serious error. I want to tell you about Kate. Kate's a nurse. She's been a high flyer. She's had numerous nursing awards. And seven years ago, she became director of a rural hospital. And there, she found a culture of bullying, harassment, and unsafe practices. So she instigated staff appraisal, quality activities, and safe hander, and she succeeded. But there was great resistance from the medical staff. Kate became a whistleblower. She suffered as a result. So Kate decided to do medicine to fix the problem from the inside. She's going to teach doctors how they should behave. And she will. She's smart, she's committed, and I really think she's one of the future leaders. In the final year, my colleagues teach the value of good clinical documentation, safe prescribing, reporting adverse events, and I teach about survival skills for interns, uh, diagnostic error, coping with sleep deprivation, and particularly how to handle disruptive behaviour in colleagues and what to look for in a good role model. The program's certainly growing. We started with 110 students in just one medical school. Now we're in four medical schools, uh, two nursing schools, and one of all allied health. The demand's certainly increasing, and there seems to be a great demand and thirst for this sort of teaching for health professional students. Well, what about after graduation? Here's the concept. All health professionals need a core, basic knowledge. For undergraduates who want to go further, we need a system of, of student electives in patient safety. For those wanting to go even further, it should be part of their specialist training. I'm going to tell you about Martin. Martin is a fighter pilot. Yes, no, no, we do need to upgrade our fleet. But, but he's also a paratrooper. He served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and he also trained as an aircraft safety officer and became responsible for aircraft safety across the entire Australian Air Force uh, including our wartime operations. And then Martin decided to do medicine. And after a first year patient safety seminar, he came up to me and said, I could make a difference here. I'd like to raise patient safety to the same level as it is in the air industry. And I think he will. So this year, Martin is going off to do a, a six week uh, elective in patient safety. He's a future leader. The next level on the pyramid is to give trainees the tools they need to make a difference. So we started a clinical practice improvement program for trainee consultants. Here they are doing our two-day introductory workshop. They then use the skills they've learnt there to go back to their hospital to initiate a practice improvement program. We give them a graduation ceremony. Here's some of the graduates. Their programs have included, for example, better specimen labelling to prevent loss and confusion, improved pathways for diabetic patients, rationalisation of antibiotics. All of those projects have, sa have helped patients. Many of them have saved a lot of money and uh, many have been presented at national and international conferences. I want to tell you about John. Uh, John's clinical practice improvement program was to prevent unnecessary admissions of children to hospital. So he established a paediatric acute review clinic where children could be sent home from emergency department, not admitted, seen early the next morning with telephone support seven days a week, 24 hours a day. The results were remarkable. Children's admissions were reduced by 24%. So the next year John established the same system in an adult teaching hospital. Again, Numerous admissions were reduced, 250 bed days were saved in the first nine months, and the hospital saved over a quarter of a million dollars. So what about the future? Well, the future depends less on the current generation of leaders and much more on the next generation. That's why it's our responsibility to find future leaders in all of the health sciences, to stimulate them, to encourage them, and to nurture them. If we can do this, the future will look good and that will be good for patients. <clears throat>
um, learning and movement builders, but also, I think, pretty good um, Pachuchka presenters. So can we thank all our speakers again? <laughs> thank you, everybody. And um, we have got time for a few questions. So we've um, taken the questions from Twitter. And um, just to say generally, there's been some good um, t Twitter, um, Twitter sphere correspondence going on. I think the quote that's been tweeted the most is one from Emma Donaldson about life is a one-time offer, use it. And uh, lots of people seem to be enjoying um, Pachuchka, which is great. So... Um, can I give you these questions? I think they're hard ones. No, it's great. Um, so somebody's asked, is there any advice on how to deal with people who may be disgruntled or annoyed by your quality improvement project rocking the, the boat in their department? Would you like to start? Oh, any advice? Go on, oh, Damon, you start. Um, so this is, this is a really big challenge, and it's really easy to stand on a stage and say, just deliver change, or like uh, rocking the boat as if it's a really easy thing to do, and it, it clearly isn't. Um, my own personal experience of delivering improved observations with our, in our emergency department is those who were a little frustrated with the mechanisms that we'd set up is to involve those people as much as I possibly could. And actually, I personally went and had meetings with them, empowered them to feel that I, I felt that they were very important, and they were very important, um, to sit down, hear their story, what their concerns were, and what I could do with my improvement project that tallied with their own vision. Because actually, I think we all have the same values. We don't always have the same vision. And if we can get on the same visionary journey when we're delivering these type of things, I think it's easier to do those improvement things. Who else like to add anything? Okay, and then Kim and then Emma, yeah? Well, so I've, I've been a uh, consultant and also a chief executive, so I've seen it from both sides, and I know that consultants and clinicians hate directives from above telling them what to do. But they do appreciate things that will make things better for their patients. So it's really about finding some evidence and trialling these things and showing them that it is better for their patients. It's the only way to convince them. They won't get convinced by a memo. Emma. I call it the vital behaviours. So you want somehow to um, change behavior. It's all, everything is always about behavior. And so if you want people to join in with your quality improvement work, I mean, why should they? Along comes yet another trainee with another bright idea. And why should they change the way they're working? So part of that is I trying to identify what's the hook for them, what's in it for them, why should they do this? And that is so important about articulating the vision, but also enabling them to be able to find that hook themselves but if it's an enabling the right skills to make something happen if you want them to do a checklist then you need to make sure that everybody knows about it how to use it don't just turn up one day and and expect people to start using it and it's about you know what's the incentive I think incentives I think I was quite naive when I started off because it's all about being altruistic and we all want to improve patient care but actually there's also a bit uh, that, you know, what's in it for me in terms of my application, moving through my career, what's my CV, how can I publish? So all of that is, and then the support of the right stakeholders is incredibly important. You need the, the, the right people behind it, but um, as said, everybody is, you've got to think about everybody. If you, there's almost certainly that when you put a change in place, you think you've involved every stakeholder, but there will always be someone that you may have missed, but it's looking at the bigger picture. But it's those vital behaviours. How can you enable the vital behaviours to happen? Great. Um, and I think, um, Margaret, you're going to be the last person on this question, because I've got another question for all of you. So what's your, what's your response? Yes. I agree with all my colleagues here, but the most important thing after you've done that is that there still are uh, colleagues who don't want to join in. Just leave them alone. Put all the enthusiastic, very good people on a pedestal and support them, empower them, and then in the end, everyone wants to join success and they will come. They will come over. Yeah. That's great, and, and I think such wisdom in this group. So, um, the next question is that you've spent several weeks okay, preparing to give your Pachuchka presentation. Okay? This is for everybody. So, we'll start with. We'll start with you, um, Emma D, and then we'll go round, okay? 
Um, how has Pachuchka changed your life, or what have you learned <laughs> from this Pachuchka experience? Okay. Um, I like the discipline. Um, I, I've discovered I actually really like this as a format, and I, I think it should be used more um, to get the concept. So I, th I think I've thought of how many medical conferences I've been to and taken very little away, but if somebody could inspire me to go away and, and read the paper, then that would be a big step forward. So um, I think it's changed the way I'm going to present. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay. And Cheryl? It's one of the most difficult presentations I've ever done and probably the most fun and the most rewarding. And I want all my presentations to be six minutes and 40 seconds from now on. Um, yeah. Um, while I don't think I want all my presentations to be six <laughs> minutes and 40 seconds long, I, I really think that the one great thing that it has brought to, to, to my style is being succinct because I actually find that quite difficult. Um, so, yeah, I think that's been a huge bonus and I think that many of the principles in Pachuchka I will definitely move to other ways of presenting. The other thing that it sort of forced me to do, which my wife was very excited by, was the fact that I finished my presentation like months in advance, whereas usually I'm doing it the night before. So, yeah, I think it's great. <laughs> yeah, great. And Marguerite? Well, I'm uh, very much inspired by leaving all the superfluous things out. And it gives more people uh, 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 a moment to share their thing in a very concise uh, presentation. So I think it's the way we should go. Michelle? I think it makes you think about every single word that you're using, it really helps you focus. And the other thing that I've loved about this is it really makes you use images in a much more creative and expressive way. So I'll be taking this forward in my future presentations. I think it's a very good discipline about you have so much you want to say and share, but it makes you distill it down to those very few key points, which is a very good for um, that's kind of like the elevator pitch, but you've got slightly longer to go. You can get right up to the 110th floor. Um, so all of those comments are entirely valid, but my best learning has come from Emma, who has virtually done this with no practice and has demonstrated an almost zen-like quality <laughs> to actually not being too concerned about the timing, but because she's not concerned about that, she delivers amazingly spot-on timing. So she wasn't even looking at the slides when she talked, uh, and I'm particularly inspired by how awesome that was. <laughs> There's hope for us all, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and Kim? Well, I've, I've learned a lot because I've, I've met a group of very interesting, inspiring people, and I've learned a lot from them. And the other thing which you probably don't know is that we all learn from each other because we do these rehearsals at some ungodly hour in Australia, and, <laughs> and, and we'd criticise each other's slides, and we'd change them as a result, and we'd criticise each other's timing. So it, this, this hasn't been eight people, this has been a team. Yeah, yeah. it's been wonderful, and, and you've you absolutely been a um, pleasure to work with. So um, I don't think we've got time for any more questions now, but... Um, Thank you all. You know, at the end of this, how many of you um, like, feel inspired now to have a go at Petuchka? Yeah. Oh, well, that's great. Yeah. Like that. And, you know, um, if, if, you, um, if you're a teacher, um, it's, it's a really great thing to do with trainees and, um, and, and students. And, and have a Petuchka night, you know, with beer and popcorn. It's, um, it's a really cool thing. <laughs> and, and go to the Petuchka night in your city. So many cities um, have Petuchka nights. Just, you know, just, just go, and, um, go and look it up. So, um, yeah, thank you all for being a part of this amazing um, session. And I think that, you know, even though we had eight very different presenters, I think there was so much consistency in what we saw. And, you know, we talked about learning needing to be hardwired, um, co-produced, um, intergenerational, and connecting with intrinsic motivation. So I think those were great messages. So um, thanks all, and, uh, and time for lunch. Thank you, everybody.